Hi class, uh, today we get to talk about the Law of Moses and I have a hymn here, but we're not going to do the with you. And in fact, we're not even going to do a quick review from last time, if you don't mind. I'm just going to go ahead and get started and jump right in. So when uh, Moses was to lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, um, uh, I like to say that, you know, the goal, let me back up. So that step from living, they'd been living in the world. They've been living in Egypt for 400 years. And um, it was easy to get them out of Egypt, but it was hard to get Egypt out of them, uh, as it says in the student manual. It was such a large step for the people to go from where they were to where they needed to be that the Lord's like, okay, you know, if you can't live the law, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fullness of the gospel, let me give you a baby step. It's like, it's like the movie, What About Bob? You know, baby steps to get from where they need to be. So the law of Moses was a preparatory step um, that, would lead, that would, you know, it, would, it was a step towards the fullness of the gospel. Remember, God loves, these people are his segula. They are his special treasure of all the treasures in the universe. The, um, at least the treasures, all the treasures at least on the earth. These, these people are really special to him. And so, um, I think that's important. And so, um, but brings up a good question. Wasn't the law of Moses given as a punishment for rejection of the higher law? See, a lot of people say that, oh, it's, it's a lower law, it's punishment, it's not, you know. And, and every law is meant to lift, inspire, and perfect. That principle includes the law of Moses. It was a punishment, but only in the sense that it was less than they could have received. Does that make sense? but it was a means for accomplishing God's end. So it brings a question, but wasn't the law of Moses at least a great step backwards? Um, I want to say no, it was actually a step forward. Not as great of a step forward as Israel could have taken, but still, nevertheless, a great step. And by the way, I know I'm good company. I know Elder Holland has taught this in his commentary on the Book of Mormon. Um, and the prophet Joseph Smith, um, he added some verses. I'm going to show you some verses um, that he added to the book of Exodus. And you're going to see them. And the words in red are the ones that Joseph added uh, in the Joseph Smith translation. So it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two other tables of stone like unto the first. So after, remember he came down the first time and he broke the, the, the two tables of stone that had, uh, had the, basically the gospel of Jesus Christ on it at least something that represented the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Lord says, So hew thee two other, stable, <coughs> excuse me, two other tables of stone like unto the first that you broke, and I will write on them also the words of the law according as they were written at, at the first, on those, meaning on those first uh, tables of stone uh, that you wrote on, um, which you broke. He says, But it shall not be according to the first, meaning I'm, it's not, I'm, I don't want you to write what you wrote on the first ones. For I will take away the priesthood out of their midst, meaning, therefore, my holy order. Holy order, meaning the holy priesthood, the higher priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood. And the ordinances thereof shall not go before them. For my presence shall not go up in their midst, lest I destroy them. In other words, they can't handle it. I can't give them the fullness of my gospel. That'll make them more accountable, and I love them, and I'm just not going to do that. They're not ready for the little kids. Spiritually, they're little kids. The Lord said, but I will give them, and remember, by the way, the red and italicized sentences I'm showing you are what the prophet Joseph Smith has added to Joseph Smith. Exodus 34, verse 1 is where, I'm sorry, I didn't put the reference on there, but it's Exodus 34, verse 1. And he says, but I will give unto them the law as at the first, I mean, the first time I gave you the law, but it shall be after the law of carnal commandments. For I have sworn in my wrath, Carnal commandments, meaning outward uh, commandments. Uh, the law of Moses was very outward, like laying an uh, animal on this altar was an outward way of saying, I sacrifice my, my lamb to you, God. But later, Jesus will say in Third Nephi 9 to the Nephites, he'll say, I don't want your sacrifices anymore. I don't want a sacrifice of an animal. I want you to offer up um, uh, sacrifice a broken heart and contrite spirit. So I want the natural man in you. I want That's what I want you to lay on the altar, not an outward thing like an animal, but I want you to lay something inward, your, your soul. Give, your, give me your time, your talents. Um, that's what I want you to give to me. Give me your obedience. Sacrifice your sins. 
your favorite sin. Just lay it on the altar. So he says, For I have sworn in my wrath that they, meaning the Israelites, shall not enter into my presence, into my rest, in the days of their pilgrimage, meaning when they made that pilgrimage from Egypt to the land of Canaan, the Holy Land, the Promised Land. Therefore do as I have commanded thee, and be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning into Mount Sinai. So, boom. All right. So, I want you to know, this is my philosophy. Okay, so I got this philosophy from an Old Testament. Um, back when I was doing uh, my dissertation on homiletics, I read a book by, um, yeah, gosh, I can't remember, Sidney Grydanus. And uh, it, it, he, the whole purpose, point of the book, was to show you how to teach Christ in the Old Testament. And I love what he said, and here's his quote. When preparing a sermon, he said, the preacher must show that there is a way to the center, even from the farthest point on the periphery. For a sermon without, uh, oops, there's a mistake there. For a sermon without Christ is no sermon. So that is my goal, is I want to point you to Christ. I want to show you that Christ is in the law of Moses. And I think that's uh, that's uh, mucho importado. There's my, my Spanish right there. Okay, I know that's not really Spanish. Mosiah, in, uh, in Mosiah 13, it says, um, it was expedient that there should be a law given to the children of Israel, yea, a very strict law, for they were a stiff-necked people. Therefore, there was a law given unto them, yea, a law of performances and of ordinances, a law of which they were to observe strictly from day to day to keep them in remembrance of God and their duty towards him. So this is part of why, this is some reasons why the law of Moses, it was strict and it was to help them to remember, you know, it was a part of their everyday life. It was part of their diet. It was a part of their morning as rituals, part of their evening rituals, afternoon, just everything A to Z. And uh, M. Russell Ballard, uh, said when he spoke to us uh, religious educators back in 96, he said, due to the rebellious nature of the children of Israel in the days of Moses, the law of sacrifice changed and became a, a strict law uh, requiring daily practices of performances and ordinances. Now you may be wondering, what the heck? What do you mean it's a law of performances? Is it like dancing? No, not not that kind of performance, uh, this kind of, uh, Noah Webster says that performance is an action, deed, thing done. That's That, that was the definition of it in Joseph Smith's day. Uh, so it, it was something you would do. Uh, so for example, a law of performances and ordinances, a law which we, they were to observe strictly from day to day was to help them remember Jesus Christ or um, just at least Jehovah God um, in every way that they had dietary laws. There were things that were clean, unclean, how you cooked your animal. Um, there were also purity laws. Um, there was laws for how a woman became clean after childbirth, after her monthly cycle. Um, and if men, uh, were, if men came in contact with any kind of, uh, fluids that came out of the body, uh, how to deal with leprosy and, and so forth. But there's also, there was an expansion. So before the law of Moses, there was only one sacrifice called the, the burnt offering. Um, but after that, um, there were five major, eventually they'll become five major sacrifices, but you could even break those five major sacrifices uh, down right here. So um, so let me give an example. So, and, and you know, this is all seems really weird, but uh, I think I'm going to, I'm hoping I can make it kind of clarify uh, that this really points us to Christ in some ways um, that they, some of them probably didn't see at least those that weren't trying to see. So uh, in the law of Moses in Leviticus 11, there was a dietary law. They had a word of wisdom. And in their word of wisdom, you couldn't eat a camel. Uh, why, oh, let me back up, there's the camel. What can you eat a camel? Because a camel was un called unclean. Um, to be clean, an animal had to, chew, had to have two things, chew the cud and it had to divide the hoof. Well, uh, camels, they chew the cud, but they don't divide the hoof. I know it looks like they do, but there's actually skin between the division. So they considered it not a, di a divide. Uh, goats, cows, sheep, you could eat them because they chew the cud and they divide the hoof. And those of you that are wondering, they grew up in the city, you don't know what it means to chew the cud. They would, this is gross, but they would burp up their, their alpha, our cows would burp up their calf alpha. And then they would chew on it some more and swallow it, burp it up, chew it up some more. <laughs> they had a couple of stomachs. They had more than one stomach. 
So I'm assuming that all animals that chew the cud had a couple of stomachs like my cows did. But um, uh, let's see, could you eat Porky the pig? No, because they divide the hoof, but they don't chew the cud. How about Nemo? Could you eat Nemo? Mm, I think you could, but this is the deal. You can't eat Flipper and you can't eat Sebastian because uh, w when it comes to aquatic life, it had to have fins and scales. So catfish, you can't eat. They don't have, I've caught them before. They don't have scales. They're slimy. Tuna, squid, sturgeon, can't eat them. No scales on them. How about um, Mickey Mouse? Nope. Uh, vermin, uh, like Mickey the Mouse, they were off limits. Um, all reptiles were off limits. And so here's something kind of interesting. You weren't allowed to eat the rabbits. And here's why. Um, uh, they split the hoof, but... Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, they, they, they don't split the hoof. But th the Jews thought that they chewed the cud. Because they, if you ever had rabbits, we had them, I had them when I was a little kid, and they, they move their mouth really fast. Like, and it looks like they're chewing the cud, but they're really not. So God, since they believe they chew the cud, God's like, okay, we'll just go with what you believe. He's speaking to them according to their language and their understanding. Um, can you eat Pluto and Winnie the Bear? Nah, you probably already know the answer. Nope, you, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't do, you can't eat anything that kills. Can, can't have turkey. Um, um, like poultry, dove, chicken, duck, geese. Um, can't eat a vulture and you can't eat an owl, can't eat an eagle. Can't, so it could be because you can't eat scavenger or carrion birds because they hunt dead animals. And uh, you can't eat birds of prey because they kill things. And so how about Jiminy Cricket? Uh, actually, you could eat Jiminy the Cricket. Uh, if, if, it, uh, if it flew or creeped on the ground, if it had jointed legs for hopping, they felt that you could... Uh, according to the law of Moses, the Lord said, yeah, you can go ahead. You can eat Jimmy the Cricket. Um, so let me just show you really quick. This, um, so Jews still do this to this day. Um, you go in a good Jewish home, Orthodox Jew, they have two ovens in their house. They cook meat in one and milk in the other. They don't mix the two. And uh, there's a lot of rules. I'll just show you some of this. I just found this little video I thought you might think is kind of fun to watch. Brought to you by GetKosher.com. Kosher? What is it? What does it mean? What makes it kosher? Kosher in Hebrew means fit, correct, or proper. Kosher is the set of Jewish dietary laws that dictate what kinds of foods can be eaten, how they need to be prepared, and what foods can be eaten together. Kosher goes back thousands of years, and it was written in the Torah. The first part of kosher is the types of animals that can be eaten and also what parts of the animal can be eaten. It is written in the Torah, any animal that chews the cud and has a cloven hoof is kosher. Cows, sheep, goats, and deer are kosher. Pigs are not kosher. It is forbidden to eat birds of prey and scavenger birds such as bats and vultures. Chicken, duck, geese, turkey are all kosher. Insects and crawling things like worms are not kosher. Fish need to have both fins and scales to be kosher. Scavenger fish are not kosher. Next part is the preparation of the food. It needs to follow strict rules in order to be kosher. Animals must be slaughtered so that there is as little pain as possible. Also, only healthy animals are kosher. Animals are carefully inspected, and if they don't meet strict requirements, they are not kosher. Any processed foods need to be prepared under strict rabbinical supervision. Foods are checked carefully to make sure the right ingredients are used and that it does not contain any small insects. It must be perfect in order to be kosher. The third part of kosher is not mixing meat and milk together. Cheeseburgers are not kosher. All meat and dairy utensils must be kept separate, so there is no accidental mixing of the two. There's a lot more to kosher and understanding it, and we recommend visiting Wikipedia. Okay, so if you go to the grocery store, any item that is kosher, I guarantee you it has a kosher symbol on it, and it's either a K, It'll just have a K on there somewhere, just just a individual K, just kind of by itself, a K with a circle around it. Sometimes it's a U uh, with a circle around it, but it's gonna let you know in some way because because the marketing, you know, food industry, they know they want. They, there's a lot of Jews in America, and they want them to buy their their food. And so if it's kosher, they'll let you know. I guarantee you. Uh, when I was in Israel, uh, we we were 
eating Mediterranean food for a couple of weeks because we went from e Egypt to Israel and we were so we were down you know when you go to Israel and for a couple of weeks or to the Holy Land you just crave 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 American food and like you just like you never have before because you get sick of Mediterranean food and you're just we're not used to it and because e everybody in our whole bus was just like dying for a hamburger and we kept asking our guide our Israeli guide to take us to McDonald's there's only one McDonald's in all of Jerusalem and he would not do it we were so mad at him we were mad at him for a lot of reasons but uh, one of our uh, girl in our group, her husband, they rebelled. And the last day of the tour, they're like, I'm not even going on the tour. They went to McDonald's to go get a hamburger. So so what happens if a uh, vermin, Mara said vermin can't eat Mickey the Mouse. What happens if he falls in your clay pot? And I know you're really wondering now, what do you do? Well, yeah, yeah you got to break the pot. That's it. Literally, that's what the law of Moses said to do. So I know you're thinking, okay, this is really strange. How does this all point to Jesus Christ? It seems so foreign, right? Because it's so foreign to the gospel of Jesus Christ, what we live today. But remember, there were many different offerings. Everything about Mosaic sacrifice, it focused on Christ. Book of Mormon, that's what the Book of Mormon is trying to teach us. That the law, so in Galatians, Paul said this. The law, I'm sorry, this is in the New Testament, not Book of Mormon. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ. Now remember that word, okay, schoolmaster. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, in the book of Alma, it says the law of Moses did strengthen their faith in Christ. And again, how does it do that? Because, you know, those kosher laws, they seem kind of weird, right? Well, we're, we're going to get there. The performances and ordinances were types of things to come. Remember we talked about types? That types um, are something in the Old Testament that are po pointing to fulfillment in the New Testament, like raising the brazen serpent on a staff. Just as it saved people, if, you know, just by raising it, Moses raising it on the staff, raising it in the air, and people came and looked at it, it would it would save them. Well, just as Jesus being raised on a cross, uh, people would look to his uh, atonement, his death, his sacrifice, paying the penalty, they would be saved too. So it's a type. So all these sacrifices, as weird as they are, even the kosher laws, they somehow point us to Christ. This is the whole meaning of the law in Alma 34. Every whip pointing to that great and last sacrifice, which will be the Son of God. Now let's talk about that first one for a minute. Galatians at the very top where it says the law, meaning the law of Moses, was our schoolmaster. That's what the Apostle Paul says when he's teaching the people of Galatia. So what does he mean by the law of Moses was a schoolmaster? Um, well, so is it this kind of schoolmaster, the guy that's really strict? We know the law of Moses was kind of strict, right? Or is the law of Moses more like a, like a Mary Poppins, you know? Or maybe it's a little bit of both. The word schoolmaster, it's pedagogos. And uh, it, it doesn't mean teacher, but it comes from the word pedagogos. And it means <clears throat> child leader, one who is entrusted with the supervision of a family, taking them to and from the school, being responsible for their safety and manners. So, by the way, that's a real statue that was found um, somewhere in the Mediterranean called Pedagogo and the Boy. And so, Pedagogo, he was some. If you had enough money as a family, you know, like in the in the ancient uh, Greco-Roman world, you would you would you would hire a Mary Poppins to come in your home and to and and um, yeah, and wealthy families had them, and and they would accompany the children um, to and from school they were to always be with them um, they would make sure they didn't associate with object objectionable companions they would teach them moral lessons um, yeah they were all over the streets you always saw um, uh, um, pedagogos all over the place and so um, yeah so that's what Paul's saying so the law of Moses is kind of like a little it's like a Mary Poppins to follow you around to teach you um, and sometimes it was strict. Sometimes it was like the guy with the stick. Um, but it was to teach them. So I had you guys look at all those uh, laws. That Remember, there's, um, there's a whole bunch of them, right? And I said, how do these um, collectively and individually, how do they act as a schoolmaster? I wish we were together and we could talk about that. And, and uh, I'd like to know which one you think that pointed you to the Savior, and which one did you think was really weird? Uh, and that's always kind of fun to talk about. Um, so uh, let me, again, 
um, let, let, let me show you how the law of Moses points us to Christ. Um, and and I, I want to say not just to point us to Jesus Christ, but point us to Jesus Christ and his gospel. Remember, that's what this class is about. Jesus Christ and the everlasting gospel. That's the name of it. So let me show you how the law of Moses is actually pointing us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So look at these three people, John, Sam, and Samson. What do they all have in common? I love asking that question. And usually only one or two people get it right. And uh, so if you're one of those two people, awesome. Here's, here's what they all have in common. They were all, you got it, Nazarites. So if we go to, um, go to chapter 6, Leviticus 6, uh, it says, The law of the Nazarites set forth, whereby children of Israel may consecrate themselves unto the Lord by a vow. Now, now when you, uh, um, let me turn there really quick. I should have been turned there already. But when you go to the law, when you go to Leviticus chapter 6, when it says Nazarite, I just want to point out that um, in, uh, ooh, that's not where it is. It's not, no, it's not Leviticus number 6. It is, I think it's, oh my goodness, I'm feeling embarrassed here. I think it's Numbers chapter 6, actually. Hang on a second. Yeah, it's Numbers. I'm sorry. I said Leviticus. It's Numbers chapter 6. Um, the word Nazarite, by the way, um, it's Hebrew, Nazir, and it means to separate. So what it's saying here is when a person chooses to make a Nazarite vow, and the scripture will say when a person vows a vow, that's the phrase that's used in number six. When a person vows a vow, uh, what they're saying is when if, if anybody chooses to to um, separate themselves from the things of this world. Um, here's what you do. And uh, the, so uh, let me show you really quick. So by the way, a, a man could make a Nazarite vow and so could a girl. So in verse two, it says, speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them whether either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord it goes on to say, he shall separate himself from wine, strong drink, vinegar, wine, strong drink, liquor of grapes, moist grapes, dried. In other words, he's saying right off the bat, he's saying, don't, I don't want you to have anything to do with raisins or grapes or wine or grape leaves. So don't even roll up your food in, in the husk of a grape leaf like they do in the Mediterranean. Don't, don't even go near them. What's interesting is Samson, when he breaks his, he breaks his covenants constantly, but one of the first things he does is he goes to down to the land of Timnath. He goes down to, it's like Napa Valley, California. It's like just all grape vineyards. And that's where he goes and gets a, a wife. Um, of all the places he should have went, he should have stayed way far from that place because he made a Nazarite vow. That's why he had long hair. And that was the other thing, is the Lord said, all the days of the vow of the separation, there shall no razor come upon his head. So he had to become a hippie for a while. Some of you would be like, whoa, that'd be awesome. And then last, oh, and by the way, at the end, it says, uh, verse 5, it says, And he shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. That's why you see some of the Orthodox Jews, the little curly locks on the side of their head. They let those grow real long. And then verse 6, the last one, it says, And uh, he shall come at no dead body. So you can't touch anything dead. And by the way, Samson kills a lion, and then later on comes by um, days later, and there's a... There's a uh, uh, a beehive inside of it and he gets inside the dead animal the cavity of it and pulls the honey out and takes it home to his family kind of gross huh so he touched a dead animal so again he broke his vow and eventually the lie will get him to cut his hair and it's all symbolic of his covenants that he makes with God and he just keeps breaking them and finally he loses his strength and that the great lesson in that when we um, when and by the way the Philistines eventually blind him and they bind him, they tie him up, and then they blind him. They cut his hair, get the lie to cut his hair, and then they bind him with cords, and then they poke his eyes out. And so it's interesting when it, you look at it figuratively, spiritually, the power in that story really is a spiritual thing. When we break our covenants, Satan wants to bind us, and he wants to blind us. Um, our strength comes in keeping our covenants, not breaking them. But uh, so, so there's a little bit of a connection there between, again, this seems really weird, but let me show you something that's kind of cool. So uh, these three things that God said to uh, abstain from, if you notice, one of them is diet, the second one is appearance, you know, how you look, and the third one is associations. So kind of weird, but okay, so think about that though. But does God care about um, 
his covenant people today. Does he care about our diet? Absolutely. We have a word of wisdom. Does he care, care about how we look? Absolutely. Especially when you go on a mission and you represent the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And then does he care about what we touch? Does he care about our associations, about what we touch, about what we watch uh, with our eyes, what we hear with our ears? Absolutely. What we eat, how we look, what we associate with, associate, sorry, I'm not saying that right, associate with, it may change uh, with each dispensation, the what, but there's an eternal principle there. Uh, and God may not want you to touch grapes in one dispensation, or he might want you to grow long hair in a dispensation, but he might, might want you to have uh, uh, groomed hair in another dispensation. So you get it. So, so the diet, so my point is that um, there's an eternal principle there. Um, what you eat in the diet may change. What, how you look and what you associate may change from dispensation because that's a policy, right? But what is eternal is I care, God saying, I care about your diet. I care about how you look. I care about what you associate with. And by the way, when he gives Israelites their dietary law, in Leviticus 11, at the very end, after giving him that holy law, which would seem weird to a lot of people, he makes this really important in principle, uh, point. The Lord says, I am the Lord your God, and you shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. So, uh, yeah, all of it is to help make us holy. And Alma, in Alma 34, I think it's Almulek that's talking in Alma, Alma 34, but he says, And behold, this is the whole meaning of the law of Moses, every whit pointing to that great and last sacrifice, and that great and last sacrifice will be the Son of God, yea, infinite and eternal. So I hope that makes sense to you. So, um, you know, uh, let's talk a little bit about the sac actual sacrifices. Cause, um, so from Adam's day all the way up to Moses' day, you know they, they sacrificed animals, but you know there's only one kind of sacrifice. It was a burnt offering, and uh, but after the law of Moses, um, uh, the Lord introduced the law of Moses. There were five. There now there would be five major sacrificial offerings, and other minor ones. Um, so besides the five, there were also like drink offering, thank offering, dough offering, incense offering, red heifer, scapegoat, first fruits, <gasps> you know, lots of them. But you could break them all. You could, you could classify them into th uh, really five major offerings. The burnt offering that you see right there, and then on the right, the peace offering, and then uh, in the middle, meal offering, on the left, sin offering, trespass offering. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the meal offering. So um, the I learned question was, at least I, I think the canvas question was, what does the flour, oil, frankincense, and salt typify in the gospel of Jesus Christ? So think about it. Let's look at that really quick. Okay, so, oops, I went backwards. Let me go forward a little bit here. So as you can see here, it says, when any will offer a great offering unto the Lord, uh, I'm sorry, a meat offering unto the Lord, the, the word meat, uh, NIV translates it to grain. Um, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. So, so the sacrifice was flour, oil, frankincense, which brings up a good question. So what is flour, oil, frankincense, and salt? What does that all have to do? Um, what does that have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What does it have to do with pointing, at least pointing them to Jesus Christ? And it says, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it on the altar, and it is a thing that is most holy. Well, um, so in the scriptures, incense, uh, you can see it on the left there, frankincense symbolized prayer. We know that because in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, it says the smoke that rose up from the incense, it was a symbol of uh, the saints' prayers rising up to God. So, um, yeah. So, but the Holy Ghost, the oil there in the middle, that is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. Because remember the ten virgins? Um, some had oil in their lamps and some didn't. Uh, they, that, they, were right, that they that were wise, according to DNC 45, they received the truth. They took the Holy Spirit for their guide and they had not been deceived. And there's a lot of other scriptures that point to uh, how the olive oil was a symbol of the Holy Ghost. And then the grain uh, symbolized the word of God. In fact, Mark 4, verse 14 
says that's where Jesus compared the word of God to a seed. And of course, Alma does that um, into verse thir in Alma 32 as well. So let's talk about the peace offerings. You're wondering like, whoa, like peace out offering? What's this mean? No, uh, it's something different. Okay, so a peace offering in ancient Israel, that sacrifice, uh, it had a lower level of holiness and it could be eaten by one making the offering, not just the priest. By contrast, only the priest could eat of the grain offering or sin offering. So um, um, the peace offering, the name comes from uh, Shelamin, and it's from the plural of Shalom or peace. And so it was like sitting down and eating dinner with God. Uh, it was like a Thanksgiving dinner. He, gives, he eats some of it because you lay some of it on the altar to be burned. And uh, you got some, and the priest would get some as well. The priests were given a portion, usually the breast, the the uh, and the right upper thigh and the and the fat and the blood were offered to Yahweh. In fact, the priests had to present the fat uh, of the peace offering as a as a special gift to the Lord. And usually, that was the the tail, um, the backbone, kidneys, the long lobe of the liver. You can see the where they're pointing. The arrows are pointing in the bottom. And the type of sheep that are raised in southeastern Mediterranean and Arabia are really known for having big, broad, fatty tails. In fact, the tails could weigh up to 15 pounds. And fat's important. Fat is so important to survival. And to give that for you and I, it's like, oh, gross, I'd be glad to give it. But back then, uh -uh. everybody knew you had to eat fat. My wife and I watched a survival show that where these people were dropped off up way, way, way up in uh, northern Canada. And uh, it was interesting, the people that, so one guy killed a moose and oh, some other gnarly kind of creature, uh, carnivore um, creature. And, uh, and he was doing really good, but this gnarly carnivore came, these carnivores came and they ate the fat off his moose. He had it up in a tree, but they got up in there. And, and so that guy started struggling because he wasn't getting fat. The guy that was catching fish, um, he did really well because there's so much uh, fat oil, fat oil in the fish, and that's what you need. So there you go. Um, if yeah, so fat's important to survival. So remember that in case you ever get stranded up in northern Canada. So there was the sin offering. Now the sin offering. This word sin, it's Hebrew, it comes from the Hebrew word chetat, and it means to miss or not hit the mark, to stumble or fall. And it, it, it's sin, it's not like a rebellious kind of a sin as much as it's like a, a sin of mistake, an error, an oversight. It, it, it's almost unintentional in, in, the, in, in the government law, be like the difference between um, first degree murder, you know, cold blooded murder and manslaughter. You know what I mean? It, it's a mistake. It came because of the weakness of the flesh. So if a person, it was a sacrifice for, for really for because of the natural man that was in people that would sometimes make them do something lustful or they were envious or easily offended. And they didn't mean to, but they it just, that's just, they're struggling in some way, right? Now the trespass offering you see on the right, that's a little different. Um, that propitiates, it, it kind of covered their sins for outright rebellion, a stealing, a disre disrespect for sacred things, a, an outward act of passion, um, like you purposely just, you know. Uh, sin offering, it, so, so sin offering, the one that I just talked about, is for uh, the sin that's in us, the natural man that causes us to do stupid things, mistakes and stuff. But the trespass offering is for the fruit of the sins. So that makes sense? So, and for rebelliousness, so. Um, now, the burnt offering is one of the most interesting, and to me, this one points to Jesus Christ, probably more than any other sacrifice, because uh, you had to sacrifice a male animal, it had to be without blemish, can't have any defects in it, and you had to offer it um, uh, voluntarily at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So you would bring your little lamb fufu, and you would voluntarily give it away. And in verse four says, and you had to put your hand on the head of the burnt offering, um, as you can see, the guy is right there because what you're doing is you're bequeathing your identity on the animal. The animal becomes you. Um, so it would atone, make atonement for you. And then it says, and he shall, in verse 5, he shall kill the bullock, that's a cow, um, before the Lord. And the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about the altar 
that is by the door of the tabernacle, and then he shall flay the burnt offering. Now, um, let me just say something about um, verse 3, about the male um, uh, without blemish. It was usually a sheep or goat. It could be a cow. Uh, it was bulls if you had a lot, you know, a cow, bull if you had a lot of money. Um, uh, average individual just gave sheep or a goat. If you're really poor, like Mary and Joseph, they gave a, 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 a pigeon. You could use give doves or pigeons. Um, but it had to be without defect. And by the way, so how does that point us to Christ? Because Christ was male. As you can see in verse 3, the animal had to be a male. And, it had, and he, had to, uh, he, had to, he was perfect. Uh, Jesus was perfect. The animal had to be without blemish because Jesus was perfect. And uh, he gave his life voluntarily. So you had to give the animal voluntarily uh, in a voluntary way. Yeah, and so in verse 4, um, since where it says he put his hand on it, you trans again, you transmitted your identity to the animal. So the animal became a substitute to pay the penalty for your sins, just as Jesus became the substitute to pay for my sins. That's the doctrine of substitution. Uh, the, the most innocent would suffer the most so I could go free. And then the sprinkling of blood in verse 5. Remember King Benjamin said, about Jesus when he prophesied what Jesus would do in Gethsemane and on the cross. He said, Blood cometh from every poor, so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness of his people. Blood symbolized life, you know, gave you life, kept you alive, but also it symbolized death, it, giving of one's life. Death is a consequence of sin, and so the animal was slain to show what happens when man sins. Also, the animal was a type of Christ through the giving of his life for man by the shedding of blood. And, and, and by the way, the, the Hebrew word which is translated by the English word atonement means to cover. Chafar is the word in Hebrew. It just means to cover. He's put the blood on the corner of the sacrificial altar there where they burned the animal. So the smearing, the splashing, the daubing of blood would cover, cover over uh, the altar. Uh, symbolic of covering sins. Uh, sins cover our atonement. They hide our sins, puts them away. So no. So God says, I, the Lord, remember them. He that repenteth of his sins, I, the Lord, remember them no more. Why? Because they're gone. They, I, they're, they're covered by my son, Jesus Christ. And I, I, I put here, this came from the student manual. There's a beautiful paradox in the idea that the righteous are those whose garments are white through the blood of the Lamb. So, um, which brings us to another thing. So at, at the, in verse six, it says, you flayed the burnt offering and you cut it into pieces. Now, I have to admit, I don't know how flaying the animal um, points us to Christ, but the hide was given to the priest. I, I, you know, I wish we were together and say, hey, what do you think? What, what, what are you seeing there? Um, but um, I don't know what cutting it into pieces has to do uh, with anything, but... Um, um, but, you know, back then, um, at least in Moses' day, um, you would have, if you and I lived in his day, we would have to actually flay the animal there at the temple, and we would cut it into pieces. We'd be responsible for that. By Jesus' day, the temple's so busy that just the priest did it. But here's something um, that I think, I think we can find how it points us to Christ. You burned all of it on the altar, um, except the hide. But every other, every other part of the animal, you burned it all. You gave it all. And so it brings a great point. So how does that point us to Christ? Well, when Jesus was on the cross, he spoke seven times. And, and one of the things he said, we learn right here in verse uh, 28, 29, and 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things are now accomplished, that the scripture might be f fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And that's one of the last things he said, probably the sixth thing. Now there was a vessel full of vinegar, and it filled, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on his sop. It's just a little plant, and they put it up to his mouth, like a spongy thing. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, "It is finished." Uh, in Luke twenty-three, it says, "He said, into thy into thy hands I commend my spirit." Now I love. Uh, I think I got this from Dumbelow, one of my favorite commentaries from the nineteenth century, and and it's like, what is going on here? Well, he. If you've ever tasted bitter, uh, vinegar, it's nasty. It's bitter. It makes you shake almost. And um, Jesus, when DNC 19 will describe the atonement, 
Gethsemane as a drinking from a bitter cup, which caused him to shake. And and so he, he thinks he's getting water, he wants water, and he tastes that nasty, bitter drink of vinegar. And um, I like what Dumbelow says. He says, the vinegar was the last bitter gulp Jesus would have to take. It represented the final step of the atonement. I think when Jesus tasted that nasty stuff, that bitterness of it, he's like, oh my goodness, I have suffered. He realizes at that moment, somehow he knew that was it. He had suffered to the nth term. He had suffered more than any, any, anyone in the universe. And uh, he could now die. He, he paid the penalty. Justice was satisfied. And so at that moment, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It's done. I've done it. I can't suffer anymore. I'm boom. Uh, that was at 3 p.m. And he died. As soon as he said that, it is finished. He died immediately. He gave everything. And that's my point. Jesus, at that moment when he took the vinegar, gave everything for us. Everything. And to me, that's why I said the burnt offering to me is the, points me to Jesus more than anything else. And that's probably why the burnt offering was was the offering that was used uh, since Adam and Eve. It never went away. It started with Adam and Eve and, and was used all through the law of Moses because it was, in my estimation, it is the most important because it points us to Jesus uh, the most. And and interesting too, you killed the, for the burnt offering, you killed it on the north side of the altar, uh, no, I'm sorry, north side of the temple. And, uh, and then you sprinkle the blood around the altar. Well, what the heck, what's that mean on the north side? Well, it's interesting. Um, if so, if you look on this, look at the top there, uh, and you'll see it says the temple was a hundred, a couple hundred yards south of here. But if you go north, if you look, what's just north of the temple? Yeah, it's Golgotha, right there, boom. And so uh, that's that's interesting. Um, I want to show you this little video, and this is like this was this is like 1990s stuff, and it it was shown in seminary. But it teaches something so powerful. So uh, the premise, the, the overview of the video is this guy goes back in time. And actually, the guy playing the part was my, was my boss, Steve Iba. But he, he goes back in time, kind of like, um, oh gosh, what was it? Back to the Future. And he goes back in time to see his younger self. And his younger self is preparing the sacrament. And his younger self, so there's an old guy the old version and then the young guy is the old guy young <laughs> and so back in the 50s and so he's seeing himself and he sees his kid self preparing the sacrament and he realizes his kid self doesn't really understand what the heck is the sacrament all about what's the bread represent what's the the water represent and so they're going to go back in time back to uh to the old testament and he's going to learn a really good lesson about the law of sacrifice First thing you need to do, Steve, is present the lamb to the priest. Now place your hands on the head of the lamb, Steve. Well, why do I do that? Well, that's the way you dedicate it to God. Then the lamb becomes a substitute for you. Why do I need a substitute? Well, there are certain things you can't do on your own. What did the Savior do for you that you couldn't do for yourself? He died for my sins. See, the atonement was something we couldn't do for ourselves. We needed a savior who could act as a substitute for us.
What's this for? You have to kill the lamb, Steve. Why does the lamb have to die? He didn't do anything wrong. Neither did the Savior. Why is it that the only perfect individual who's ever lived upon this earth had to die? Why did he have to die? Only a perfect person like the Savior could offer himself as a perfect atonement. Only by relying upon his offering can we be perfected. He died to satisfy the demands of justice so he could extend mercy to us. And he did it willingly. of his blood that we live. I understand. Okay. Um, and Russell Ballard said, at the fulfillment of the law of Moses, uh, the Lord changed the practice of the law of sacrifice Prior to the atonement, blood sacrifice pointed forward to his sacrifice. After the atonement, the sacrifice points minds back to the atonement. So uh, I think that's important that they were looking forward to the atonement. So it was, some of my students always ask, is it easier to look forward to the atonement or is it easier to look back? And I think it's easier to look back because we have scripture, we have evidence, we have things that show us that it, it truly did happen. Um, so for them, the, uh, the sacrifice of the animal, that was their ordinance then. But um, every Sunday, this is our ordinance now. We, they look forward, we look back to remember what he, do, he has done for us. And I just want you to know that I am so grateful for Jesus Christ for giving his life for me. He has given me so much. I lived 21 years without him. And and what he's given to me since I've come into the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, I'm in Arizona right now recording this. And, you know, coming back home here and it reminds me a lot of my old life. And a lot of the challenges and things, the, the darkness, the things that were not in my life. And the things that were in my life. And that, I, um, But I, I, I just am so grateful for everything he's done for me and all that I have now. And... Um, He's just brought me so much goodness and joy and I'm grateful for him for his sacrifice for paying the penalty for my sins so I could be forgiven and so I could grow and I could become more like him and I can have as much joy uh, in this life you know and um, I always tell my students the gospel of Jesus Christ is not insurance against pain um, but it is a resource to go to when the pain comes Jesus is the resource because he paid the penalty for our sins. He suffered in Gethsemane. He died on the cross. And he rose on the third day. He conquered sin and he conquered death. And because of that, I can, I can do. I can conquer anything and everything because with him, I can do it. By him and through him. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>